Hi, everybody. Uh, warm greetings from Zagreb. So we are very excited to have our third webinar uh, from University of Zagreb, Faculty of Economics and Business. So this webinar will be uh, on the topic, the future of artificial intelligence, rise of deep learning models. Here I have my colleague Tomislav Medic. Uh, he's really very interesting in this topic and I think he will be able to contribute a lot. Uh, he will tell you and show you some very interesting things. So I think you will, you will learn a lot today. Uh, if you have any questions, you're always welcome to write to us uh, and we will answer you anything that, that, that you need. So uh, now I am leaving the floor to Tomislav and he will introduce you to this topic a little bit more. So Tomislav. Thank you very much, Professor. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really uh, great to have this opportunity to uh, talk a bit about artificial intelligence uh, today. It's a topic that's been really popular in the media uh, as of late, so it's really a good timing. Um, it's one of my uh, primary research subjects, so I'm going to go over a bit of it uh, in this presentation. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll learn something new. And if you're interested in any of the materials I mentioned, um, in this presentation or webinar, uh, feel free to contact me to discuss more. So as Professor said, my name is Tomislav Medic. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Informatics at Faculty of Economics and Business uh, in Zagreb. I'm also currently a PhD uh, candidate um, and my primary topic for my PhD is actually artificial intelligence, actually a subset of artificial, artificial intelligence, which I will mention today as well. Um, so a bit about the content of uh, this webinar, we're gonna go over uh, AI in general, what uh, exactly it is, a brief history um, of artificial intelligence, and then we'll go over uh, the current status of this technology, and we'll see what we can expect uh, in the future. So what is artificial intelligence? It's a pretty common term used a lot uh, these days. So pretty sure you've heard about it before, but just to uh, put everything into context, uh, it's a type of uh, technology that allows computers to basically learn from experience and to adapt to different uh, situations and to perform various tasks that are currently performed by humans. So why is this uh, an interesting definition? Well, basically, uh, if I were to ask anyone uh, that is viewing this presentation, uh, if a personal computer is smart or intelligent, I think most of you would said, say that it is. Um, but when you go uh, a bit into depth, uh, you can actually see that uh, computers are not that smart, actually. they. They are pretty powerful and fast. Um, they have strong computational power, but they are not able to um, adapt, to understand data, to learn from data and so on. So here's where artificial intelligence comes in. It basically bridges the, the missing uh, piece that, uh, that now allows computers to, to adapt and to, to learn. Um, so we can now train computers. We can teach them how to um, how to take a certain amount of data, um, do some analysis on it, tasks, learn from it, and then based on that data uh, to perform various tasks. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's a pretty broad uh, subject. It's a it's a really wide field that includes a lot of um, different applications and different technologies um, to basically solve uh, various various tasks. So we have, for example, personal assistants like Siri and Alexa. We have, uh, we have um, AI that plays uh, video games and chess and Go. 
and other uh, games. We have self-driving cars um, that are being developed by large companies like Google and Tesla and so on and so on. So they all uh, use some kind of artificial intelligence. Not all of them use the same type uh, or the same approach uh, to artificial intelligence, um, but it's all basically uh, the result of one single technology that is a subset of artificial intelligence and that's um, really allowed all these technologies to prosper. So um, I'm talking about uh, deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And this is the technology that's uh, being used the most today that's seen um, the most advancements and that is being integrated in a lot of these uh, fields that I mentioned uh, a minute ago. Uh, besides deep learning, we also have natural language processing, which is another um, another subset of uh, artificial intelligence that is also really important, um, but uh, it also, um, it also um, saw its increase in efficiency because of deep learning. So deep learning is really uh, the one behind it all, um, but right next to it is natural language processing as well. So I'm gonna start at the beginning. So I always like to, whenever I'm talking about a certain topic, start uh, from the beginning to cover all the bases. So I'm just gonna uh, briefly touch uh, upon the history of uh, this technology. It's a really long history. Um, it's not a new technology. It's been with us for a while, uh, but for the first time in history, we actually have the technology uh, to back it up, or we have the processing power and the data to actually uh, use uh, these these technologies, such as deep learning, in a, in an efficient way, and to use it in something uh, that can benefit uh, benefit our industries. So where did it all start? The the official history uh, is um, 1943 when uh, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts um, published their work and uh, in which they uh, presented um, a type of model, um, a mathematical model, that's um, basically the first, uh, first type of an artificial neuron um, that's basically part of deep learning. Uh, and here is where, where it all officially started. However, artificial intelligence is much, much older than that, uh, all through the beginning of the 90s. Um, so 40 and 50 years uh, prior to this official date, um, artificial intelligence was actually uh, popularized by science fiction uh, novels. Um, they introduced uh, these uh, robots or autonomous um, autonomous humanoids and uh, something that reminded uh, something that reminds of um, this modern artificial intelligence. So uh, it was it was actually pushed into uh, pushed into uh, existence much much sooner uh, and much before this this year. That is the official date. Um, of artificial intelligence. However, not until uh, 1950s, uh, 56 to be precise, did we have the term artificial uh, intelligence. It appeared uh, at a conference in uh, Dartmouth University um, and it was coined by John McCarthy. Uh, five or six years before that, um, Alan Turing also published uh, uh, his paper, Computer Machinery and Intelligence, uh, which was the basis of uh, something called a Turing test, uh, which is actually something that is uh, still used um, this day to this day. Um, and uh, actually in the beginning, it was called the uh, Im imitation game. Um, if you're familiar with, with Alan Turing, uh, imitation game is actually the name of the movie uh, which was uh, which was uh, published sometime in the mm, 2010s, I think. I'm not sure of the exact uh, date, but basically, it's a movie about Alan Turing and uh, his struggle to 
used uh, the computers of that day to help in the in the world war but back to back to our topic uh, so in 1950s is actually where uh, it all really uh, sped up um, the term artificial intelligence came into existence and the uh, whole technology was uh, pretty popular in these times um, however uh, this did not last uh, long um, maybe 20 years or so in 1974 i think somewhere at the beginning of 1974 uh, is the official start of a um, time period called as uh, artificial uh, winter um, there were actually two ar um, artificial intelligence winters uh, which marked the time period where uh, the development of this technology slowed down uh, significantly. So there was a um, decrease in investment. Um, the term uh, artificial intelligence were, wasn't as popular as it was in the 50s. Um, so the decrease in investment and the development uh, as a whole uh, saw this time period um, up until nine, uh, 1980s uh, where not much happened in the field of artificial intelligence. Uh, there are various reasons why this uh, happened. One of them was that the technology at the time uh, wasn't able to keep up with uh, artificial intelligence. So the technology that was available then uh, wasn't good enough, basically wasn't strong enough to, um, to bring any sort of significant uh, AI model uh, into existence. So it was mostly theoretical, um, not much uh, in a practical sort of sense uh, happened in these days and nothing would happen, uh, nothing would happen until the, until the 1980s. So um, in the 1980s um, and up until 87, we saw um, another increase uh, in development of artificial intelligence, uh, primarily because of expansion of um, AI algorithms um, that followed up with increase in funding and research. And uh, we saw the first practical application of uh, AI in a commercial sense uh, via expert systems. So a lot of businesses implemented so-called expert systems, um, which uh, were used to optimize uh, performance or uh, business processes and so on. Um, after that, uh, 87 to 93, a second AI winter arrived again. Uh, we saw a decrease in funding, uh, decrease in research, um, and the whole field of AI sort of stagnated. And then in the late 90s, uh, we saw a revival uh, yet again, and it lasts uh, up until uh, this day. And now it actually started to uh, grow and at an exponential rate, much, much faster, much, much stronger than ever before. I will explain uh, why in a bit. So in 97, I uh, have to I have to mention this. In 97, it's a pretty popular event. We have AI beating the reigning world chess champion and grandmaster Gary Kasparov, which was a, um, a big deal back then because um, it really uh, pushed the technology to a lot of people. So it wasn't as popular and as famous uh, back then. So it was still kind of a novel technology. People did know about it, uh, but didn't know exactly what it looked like and what it can do. And in 97, uh, we had this uh, event that really uh, promoted the technology as a whole. Um, in the same year, we also had the first speech recognition software that was uh, launched by Dragon Systems. It was integrated, I think, into one of the windows uh, from Microsoft. I'm not sure about that, but um, it did, uh, it did um, arrive in 97, the same year. So um, a lot of uh, things, as I said, this is just a short um, overview of the history. A lot of uh, things I haven't mentioned here um, that are pretty important. I'm not going to go uh, too much into the history. Uh, there are a lot of uh, 
great and significant contributions that were made by a lot of researchers and companies that really um, brought this technology forth and made it what it is uh, today. Uh, so if you are interested in how it all uh, happened throughout the, uh, throughout the years, um, um, you can study, uh, study it a bit on your own, or you can send me uh, an email or ask in the chat and I will uh, give it, give it uh, my best to uh, respond. So um, it's not that uh, at the previous slide that the AI history stopped at 97. It's just um, um, a lot of happened uh, since then. I don't want to go too much uh, into it. I want to cover where we are now instead of what led us, uh, everything that happened that led us uh, to here. But where are we now? Uh, we are at a point where um, basically most of uh, companies and institutions use some sort of uh, AI model um, in their operations and business and so on. Uh, we see a lot of technologies uh, um, being surrounded by AI and being um, made um, useful and efficient because of AI. Um, and just some of these are autonomous vehicles that have been um, in the media uh, a fair amount um, in the last couple of years. This is a technology, one of the technologies that we can expect fairly soon uh, to be adopted uh, worldwide. So we do have autonomous vehicles. <clears throat> they are available. Uh, they do, uh, they, uh, they exist and they drive on the streets. They are, however, not commercially available. And they are not as common as they will be in the next few years. Uh, next to autonomous vehicles, uh, something I'm sure you've uh, heard about uh, in the media in the last uh, weeks or months. If you're watching this uh, in the future, I'm sure you'll uh, learn uh, a lot more about this technology. Um, I'm talking about, of course, generative chatbots and virtual assistants or generative language models. Um, there are a couple that are available. One of them, which is the at the forefront, at least at the, at the time that this webinar is being recorded, is uh, ChatGPT. Um, this is the technology I'm going to talk um, a bit more in the next few slides. Um, besides uh, these two, we also have computer vision and robotics. And in the end, we have expert systems. Of course, um, there are a lot more variations to this technology. Uh, these are just uh, some some of them that I um, that I wanted to uh, wanted to show in this presentation. However, as I said, artificial intelligence is a really large uh, field with a lot of subsets that are specialized in different kinds of computations and specializations within um, various industries. So um, um, it's impossible to list them, or at least I would need a lot more time to uh, list and explain them all. These are the four I thought uh, were some of the uh, most interesting that we have today. So uh, autonomous vehicles, just to uh, briefly go over this uh, one more time, uh, because of um, the implication that this technology uh, brings uh, with it. Uh, so most of people I talk with and uh, students I um, um, have at my lectures, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, uh, most of them uh, just say, OK, we don't have to drive anywhere. Uh, not a big deal, uh, and so on and so on. But um, that's, it's not as simple as that because the technology of um, automated uh, driving is uh, much, much uh, stronger than that because uh, not only will we uh, have uh, cars that will be able to drive us uh, anywhere without uh, us actually driving, um, this will also include uh, automated deliveries uh, like um, Walt and Glow are some of the companies that um, are that are active here in Zagreb. Um, not only that, but uh, deliveries, um, international deliveries. So if you order something from a distant country, this will all be automated. 
And what this means is that it will be faster, it will be safer, and it will be much cheaper, and it will be cleaner. So all good things um, will come from uh, autonomous vehicles. Not only that uh, we as our personal uh, drivers will not have to drive the, the car to get from point A to point B, uh, it's a much broader impact uh, of this technology um, than that. Um, and as I mentioned previously, even though they are not yet widespread, um, they will they will come to our market fairly soon. And uh, I think it's a it's a personal opinion. It doesn't have to be that um, that they will um, they will be um, implemented into the market uh, fairly fairly um, fast. So once they get to uh, once they get commercialized. Um, they will be adopted um, really, really fast, in my opinion. Um, so the other um, the other field that I mentioned are generative language models uh, that are currently led by ChatGPT, but it's not the only generative language model out there. There's um, a lot more. Um, are some of the models or uh, technologies that are uh, pretty, pretty uh strong um strong at the moment uh it was all uh it all happened um a few weeks back when chat gpt was first announced uh it was made available to uh to the public um and a lot of a lot of uh, people started using it and they saw how powerful powerful it is unfortunately i don't have this chart on this uh, presentation um but um i'm gonna try to estimate so some of the applications um that we know that are uh, pretty famous and popular such as TikTok uh, or instagram uh, so for example TikTok uh, required around um I'm, I'm i'm just gonna guess i'm not sure of the exact amount i just wanna put it into co context so to reach 100 million uh users TikTok required i think it was uh 12 months or so instagram um instagram required even more around uh 24 months or something and chat gpt only required two months so um quite a, a big difference uh, there um so the 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 tool is really popular uh but if we look uh, besides that, we can actually see the technology behind it, which is the one I mentioned before. It's a var variation of uh, deep learning um, technology, uh, namely neural networks and natural language processing working together. Um, and the big deal about this technology is that for the first time, we have a model that can actually mimic uh, a human conversation. So basically you can talk to this ai it can remember what you asked it before it can give a response based on your previous queries uh, and so on and so on basically it uh, reminds uh, a lot about uh, um, it, it reminds a lot um, uh, about human written text uh, when you're talking to one of these uh, models so um, besides chat gpt uh, which is uh, a model from OpenAI. We also have uh, Lambda, or uh, the, the tool is actually called BART from Google. We also have BERT, uh, XLNet, and much, much more. So um, these models um, have seen a large, large um, increase in the last uh, few years, and they're slowly, or not so slowly, they're... Um, uh, They've been slowly, they're slowly been de developed, but they will be implemented fairly fast into the market. And uh, one of the most common questions that are uh, that appears when talking about these generative language models is, will it replace human jobs? And the answers by various experts in the field uh, vary. So we cannot be sure, but. Um, I think most of them agree that no, it will not replace human jobs. It will just um, 
it will just make uh, humans better at their job. So it has the ability to boost performance, productivity, efficiency, uh, while simultaneously cutting costs. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and it will also automate and speed up numerous uh, jobs that were previously performed by people. So, um, for example, if you uh, took something to program uh, three hours before using ChatGPT, a human can now uh, do the same thing in 20 minutes. So um, we still need humans. Uh, ChatGPT and other generative language models cannot replace a human at um, most of the jobs, um, but it will definitely boost productivity um, in these uh, in these jobs. And in the end, uh, one more thing I'd like to uh, mention: expert systems that were uh, also mentioned in the history of AI uh, have also seen sort of an increase in in the usage. Uh, mainly because the AI and artificial intelligence model that the expert systems are based on um, have been um, perfected or not perfected, but they've seen an increase in performance um, and decrease in costs. So the expert systems that are now built around them are much, much more um, efficient. Uh, what is an expert system? It's basically um, a system that's based on artificial intelligence that uses uh, certain knowledge stored uh, in a knowledge base to solve problems that will usually require a human expert. Um, just to mention what are the some of the benefits that uh, this kind of system bring. Uh, basically, um, they're at a level of a human expert, but they're much uh, cheaper to attain the knowledge from these systems. Uh, they're much uh, cheaper. They don't tire. They don't need to sleep. They don't need to eat. They're um, available 24 seven and they're available to multiple users at once. So um, all the things that a human expert uh, is simply not. Um, and now expert systems have seen an increase um, and they've spread to various industries. Uh, here we have um, um, some examples from these industries. So uh, Cadet Cancer Decision Support Tool is being uh, used to identify cancer um, in its earliest uh, stages. Um, Dendrol helps chemists to identify uh, organic molecules. Uh, the Explain is a clinical support system uh, the diagnosis, various diseases, and so on and so on. You can uh, you can see a certain team appearing here. So a lot of these expert systems are used in the medical industry, but uh, these are not the only industry they're being used in. Um, they're also uh, being tested and used uh, in law. So um, there was a research, um, can't really remember the name, um, that compared um, um, an expert system and a lawyer, so and a human lawyer. And the research found out that uh, a human lawyer was um, around 70 to 75% correct in his um, advices to his clients. And the expert system based on AI was 90% uh, and more um, uh, correct in these uh, situations. So this was just uh, an isolated study. Uh, but still, still a simple uh, example of these uh, systems um, can really show the potential they, they have um, in various industries. Um, a lot of businesses uh, use them. So medical industry, law, uh, education, they are uh, being uh, used because um, they're pretty easy to uh, implement in various businesses. Um, and once the knowledge is uh, stored and the system uh, can access it, it can seamlessly blend into uh, various various processes and, and jobs and so on. So all of these uh, technologies, I'm going to mention a few more uh, a bit later. Uh, but all of the things that we heard so far um, is basically uh, based on deep learning. 
so uh, as I said before, deep learning is a specific uh, subset of uh, artificial intelligence, or first it's a area of machine learning, but machine learning is subset of artificial intelligence. And it's a, a new approach to uh, learn from data. And this is what allowed uh, computers to become intelligent or smart uh, to connect to the question I asked uh, at the beginning. So they can now learn from data. Uh, we have the tools, we have the algorithms to um, um, to teach them um, from the, to teach them to to feed them data and to teach them how to respond and how to act on this data. Um, and they can now uh, do various uh, various jobs on their own. Uh, modern deep learning um, often involves a lot of successive layers of representation, which will be uh, shown in the next slide just to give the visual um, of this process um, might make it a bit more easier to uh, understand. But um, simply put, deep learning is uh, actually uh, a mathematical framework from uh, learning representations from data. What it actually means in practice, um, before I show what it actually means in practice, um, I just put the AI hierarchy uh, just to visualize the whole field of AI and where uh, deep learning uh, fits uh, into AI. So artificial intelligence is the broad uh, field. Machine learning is just one part. And inside machine learning, we have uh, deep learning, one of the technology that uh, is being used the most today. So back to deep learning um, and how it works. Um, so as I said, this is the a technology that um, allowed all the all the um, applications in various fields that I mentioned before to uh, be efficient and to be possible. Um, and they were actually modeled uh, based on a, a, a human brain. They're, they don't work the exact same way as a human brain, but they do kind of remind of the structure of human brain. The naming conven convention of deep learning uh, um, is taken from uh, neurology or study of the human uh, neuroscience study of the human brain. Um, so we have something called artificial neural networks. So inside a human brain, we do have a neural network. And in uh, deep learning, we have artificial neural networks. Um, in these uh, networks, um, neural networks, um, we have series of uh, algorithms that are linked to each other and that are created to recognize uh, patterns in this data. So this is one of the advantages of uh, deep learning that it can recognize uh, patterns uh, in a certain dat data set. Uh, their application is very widespread and is uh, used in various fields, as I've mentioned before. And now to take a look uh, at how it, uh, how it works under the hood. So a neural network consists of um, multiple layers. Um, as you can see in this um, image to the right, uh, we have three layers shown here, but a modern uh, deep learning neural network that is actually used, we have much, much more thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these layers. Um, and basically, when it all boils down to the basics of it, we can see that there is an input layer. We have one or multiple hidden layers that crunch this data. And then we have a certain output um, in the output layer. So each of these layers, um, the circles that you can see that are connected to each other are neurons, so similar to a human brain. Uh, neurons are connected in a network and uh, they um, they transfer uh, uh, information through this network. It is the same in deep learning. Um, and how they do it is um, not as efficient as a human brain, um, but as I said, um, computers are pretty powerful these days. Uh, so they can do it quite fast, but the human brain is much more efficient uh, at learning than uh, an, uh, an artificial neural network is. Um, but basically, um, how a neural 
artificial neural networks uh, learns is using something called weights. Um, so each layer in the network will receive certain data and then they will, uh, I like to say, crunch the data and it will uh, give some sort of output that it will send to the next layer or the um, next neuron that it's connected to. Uh, and between these neurons is something we call weights uh with which we can then correct the results that the neuron or uh, entire layer has produced and this is um actually called training the network uh training um models in deep learning or artificial intelligence uh, as a whole is um really important um and in deep learning we use weights uh to do this i said it's pretty in, uh, inefficient because um uh, there are there are more reason, uh, reasons than one, but uh, um, the obvious reason is that these weights are randomly assigned at, at the beginning. So they're randomly assigned, the neural network does its job, neurons do, do their work, uh, and then the correction of these weights uh, starts. So this is pretty inefficient as a whole, but um, it still works. So it is being, uh, uh, it, it is being used in uh, most of the models. There are, of course, different uh, types of training. I will briefly mention um, what those are. Um, but basically, just to give an overview of uh, um, a slightly larger neural network, so how it would look like. Of course, this is just a representation of neural networks. It's uh, behind the curtain. It's all just math uh, this is just a visualization of it so all the neurons are connected to each other in a neural network they all do some kind of computation they receive data they crunch data and they send um, an output they create an output and they send it <clears throat> down the network um, still this as i said is a slightly larger uh, representation than the one we saw before but if we were to represent an actual deep learning neural network, uh, it wouldn't fit, or at least it won't, wouldn't be visible uh, on a PowerPoint slide. So there's a lot of these neurons that are connected to each other. So how does it uh, work? Was the was the engine behind it all? Um, I added hello world uh, to the title of the slide. Uh, don't be confused by that. If you've ever encountered programming, this is the uh, first thing that you learn when, uh, when you start learning a new programming language is basically to create a program that says uh, hello world or uh, prints hello world to the screen. Um, so why is this uh, here on this slide is because the image that we can see on the right uh, side of the slide is uh, something um, of a hello world in terms of neural networks it's an image that is most used to describe how a neural network uh, works so if we try to connect the previous images that we've seen with this one we can see that our input layer contains a handwritten uh, number or four in this case we have four hidden layers uh, and in the end we have the output layer um, that's represented by numbers from zero to nine so just to put this into context um, when you give a number to an ai uh, that's uh, uh, digitally typed so that's typed on a pc it has no uh, trouble whatsoever to recognize what the number is to um, to do mathematical operations on it. So add, subtract to it and so on. Uh, because all of the numbers, all of the letters, um, they use keyboard to input uh, into, uh, into a PC are actually coded by a code table. Um, and the computer only needs to look up the digit that you gave it in the code table and will, it will automatically know um, what the number is. It's not the same when you give it a handwritten digit because there's no uh, one uh, one type of a handwritten uh, digit. So my number four and your number four 
will be uh, different. Um, and that's especially important when it comes to a computer because computer will um, read my number four and your number four a different way uh, because the um, pixels will not correspond to each other and it will uh, see it as two different images, even though you and I both would know that it is number four that is written on um on a paper or a screen so that's the uh, basic problem that this image tries to uh tries to represent so a neural network would uh, get this input in a um, handwritten number four uh, in the input layer it would then uh, scan the pixels it will do the math and in each layer, it will try to scan a different uh, pixel in the image. It will create new information and it will send this information uh, down the line, down the network. And uh, in the end, once the neural network and all the neurons um, uh, do their job, in the end, we get the final output. We uh, get the number four that you can see uh, with the white box next to it. So the neural network. Um, recognize that uh, this is number four so based on the math that uh, that was conducted on pixels that were in the image with the handwritten number four um, the ai or deep learning uh, neural network was able to recognize that it's number four so this is just a simple or a simplification of the whole process of uh, neural networks and it's one that is uh, most commonly uh, used when you encounter uh, and when you study neural networks. Um, if we were to get uh, some other number in the output layer, for example, the, the neural network uh, misclassified this handwritten uh, digit as number two, then we would use weights uh, to try to uh, fix uh, fix its uh, processes or fix the math that the neural net network uh, used to get to the output. And by doing so, we would then try to optimize the model and have it uh, guess the correct number the next time. So here's a, a bit more uh, clear uh, overview, but still, still a simplification of the whole process, but uh, just a um, clear overview of how the network or hidden layers would uh, approach uh, this image. So layer one would uh, analyze certain uh, pixels and then it would come to some sort of conclusion and then it would uh, send it down the line and in the end, hopefully we get the right result. Um, there are of course, different types of neural networks in deep learning, um, some it's sim it's um, similar to programming languages. They um, they have um, a similar logic behind it, but they have a different way of doing it. So some of the most common ones or uh, most used ones are listed here on the screen, such as multilayer perceptron, uh, which is used for speech recognition, machine translation. And classification, we have feed forward neural networks, which is used for simple classification and face recognition, uh, recurrent neural network and long short term memory, which is a subset of recurrent neural network. They are listed here because I use them in my research. Um, they're mostly used for text processing, text to speech and sentiment analysis. And then we have the convolutional neural networks which are uh, mostly used for computer vision. Um, and they're uh, out of these five, probably the most known and uh, most popular. Um, they have this uh, extra uh, layer, convolutional layer that brings um, something new to the neural network and it allows uh, the network to do uh, some, some um, tasks more efficiently than uh, all the other neural networks. But as I said, it's similar to programming languages. You can use any of these networks for pretty much everything. It's just that some networks are 
uh, better at certain jobs uh, than others. So you always try to use the network that is more, uh, that is most suitable for uh, the job. For example, you can use convolutional neural network for computer vision, um, um, face recognition, uh, speech recognition, and so on. Maybe not all of these, but um, some of them can be done by um, by multiple neural networks. There are, of course, uh, much more than these five. Um, we have new ones uh, showing up. So um, it's, again, I don't want to waste too much time listing also. Um, I put in uh, an image on the next slide just to show you some other kinds of neural networks. Um, and of course, they vary uh, in the level of complexity and uh, their structure um, and um, the way they um, they send and um, they send data through the network. Some can uh, even remember certain data. They can bring it back through the network and so on and so on. So there's a lot of different um, types of neural networks. Um, uh, I don't want to open uh, YouTube, uh, but I'm sure this PowerPoint will be available to you somewhere. Uh, so this link will lead you to a YouTube uh, video that uh, basically shows a simulation of a neural network, neural network. Uh, which um, um, which shows the the difference in um, in the way these neural networks uh, work. So you can see a simulation in a 3D overview. You can see how a feedforward neural network or a current neural network or a convolutional neural network uh, would operate. So it's a pretty interesting video uh, if you get the chance uh, uh, watch it. It's not that uh, long, and you can. Uh, really see, uh, and it will make some things uh, much more clear than uh, than just uh, looking at it um, in a PowerPoint slide. So all of uh, the things that I've um, mentioned uh, up, until, up until now um, are fairly simple. The digit conversion, the classification, the recognition of a, a handwritten um, uh, letter or a digit, the inputs, the hidden layers, the output layers, and so on, um, are fairly simple mechanics. Um, and it brings us to uh, one of the f favorite, quote, favorite quote, quotes of mine from um, this field of our AI, um, quote by Francois Cholet, they said, these are simple mechanisms that once scaled end up looking like uh, magic is something that I completely agree with. Uh, when you get into the technology and everything uh, in depth, uh, you can see it actually is not that complex that um, something like artificial intelligence or deep learning or machine learning um, makes you think when you um, hear of all these models and what it can do when you look under the hoods, uh, most of it, it's fairly simple mechanisms, something that we uh, in theory knew uh, years and years ago. Uh, but once you scale it, so once you uh, increase the impact uh, or the scale that uh, these technologies uh, operate on, then it really does uh, start to look like uh, magic and we can see um, uh, we can then see uh, cars driving themselves. We can see uh, flying cars uh, with no drivers, drones, and so on. Uh, without pilots, uh, we can see uh, various technologies. Uh, we can even uh, implement new concepts based on these technologies, which I'll um, uh, talk a bit more um, soon, um, but definitely, uh, really powerful, uh, really powerful qu quote uh, by Francois Cholet. So uh, where does it all fit in? So um, this technology allows uh, us to train computers uh, to do, to perform specific tasks by processing large amounts of data and to recognize patterns in, in data. Why is this important? Because we're at uh, a time in our uh, history of humans 
where we have so much data that it's impossible uh, for us humans to analyze it, to um, do something out of it. Um, and we have AI models uh, and deep learning models that can do that fairly easily. Um, and we can use this to um, basically uh, make computers uh, solve some uh, problems that uh, we weren't able to solve ourselves. Um, one example that comes to mind is uh, global warming. So uh, with the um, enough with enough amount of data, correct data, we can use uh, these models to basically solve um, solve problems like global warming um, and others. Uh, we can cure some diseases um, that weren't curable before and so on and so on. So these models are only getting stronger. Um, they're getting um, more popular, which means more investment, which means more people in the industry, more researchers, and so on and so on. Um, in the next few years, we can uh, really... Um, really see the power of this technology even though we can um, we can already see it uh, today but it's um, not nearly close to its peak i'm sure we'll see quite a bit more from artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, in the years to come so why is it all happening now are we just that lucky to live uh, in the time when ai will basically um, make our lives better and easier well as i said the history of ai is uh is pretty long uh, but the times we uh, live in now is basically when we have the technology to support so the other technology to support uh, development and the application of ai what do i mean by this well first off uh, internet is something that uh that was the the first uh the first um first thing that allowed ai to really uh really um, develop and to um start the exponential growth that we see today so internet is definitely uh one of the things that is um that allowed ai to to expand um and uh, something that is um directly uh, linked to the appearance of internet is the amount of data that we now have available via internet uh, we also have the technologies to to store uh, these large amounts of data so if you only look at the available storage um, uh, memory or storage devices that were available 20 or 30 years ago and you look at storage devices today you will see this drastic uh, difference in the capacity of these devices. Uh, so not only that we uh, create more data, um, we also have the means to store it, to analyze it, um, and so on. So this is really important because um, data is um, food So um, for AI. So what food is for humans, data is for artificial intelligence without data um, none of these models or technologies that we've seen so far uh, could exist so data is really really important and besides data we now have the processing power to run these models um, and to uh, have them um, do the work that were uh, that they were designed for this was not possible before um, same same example with the storage devices if you go back and you look at uh, processing devices so uh, central processing unit or graphics processing unit and you compare them to devices or components that we have today you can once again see uh, this drastic uh, difference in the capacity of uh, one and the other um, and again this is something that allowed ai to thrive so uh, specifically uh, with processing power, uh, here we have two images that if you look at them, maybe um, don't, maybe they don't make much sense, uh, but let me explain. So 
where are these uh, two images here? Um, basically, they're here to um, compare uh, two different devices. So one is, of course, smartphones that we have today, and the other is a computer um, or a device or a system that was um, um, that was in charge or that was that allowed humans to go to the moon. Uh, if you believe in something uh, like that, that that happened, so a system or a, a, a computer that was um, behind it all, so that did all the operations, the math to um, take humans to moon, was actually a million times less powerful than any of the smartphones we have uh, on the market today. If you have a smartphone, uh, you can assume it's at least a million times. Uh, faster, and I'm not over exaggerating. This is um, a real number, a million times. So if you look at memory, um, the system that did the uh, math and uh, calculations for a moon landing, um, its memory um, was described in kilobits, uh, and today we have gigabits or um, gigabytes, sorry, and terabytes, and so on. So. It really is a million times more powerful than than the computer um, that brought humans to the moon. So why am I telling you this? Because all of us now uh, carry a pretty strong device in our pockets. And if you look at some of the other devices or some, some of the other uh, computers that are available, personal computers, supercomputers, and so on, um, then you can uh, start to guess um, in which direction this is heading. So this is something that really allowed AI to reach the level um, that um, um, to reach the level it's at uh, today. Um, but again, it's also a bit limited by the technology still. So we still have a ways to go. I will mention another technology that will uh, probably allow AI to breach this uh, limit. Um, but as it stands, the technology that we have today is good enough for AI to uh, become useful and efficient at certain tasks. Uh, this is mainly um, mainly uh, because of GPUs, graphics processing unit, which were um, actually designed to accelerate graphics processing, so uh, image rendering, video re rendering, and so on. Uh, but its um, processing power um, um, turned out to be uh, really great for some other uh, uh, uses, uh, not just um, graphics processing. Uh, one of the examples is, of course, artificial intelligence. And the other is, of course, cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Uh, if you followed the news um, regarding cryptocurrencies and uh, blockchain technology, I'm sure um, you've heard about um, multiple GPUs being used to um, to mine uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, so as it was for cryptocurrencies and blockchain, it's same for AI. Some of the models um, uh, use uh, GPU power to um to basically operate and um, do what they were they were designed to do so um, modern artificial uh, intelligence infrastructure um, would not be complete without them meaning that it would still probably exist but it would definitely not be at the level um, that it's at uh, currently so gpus um, did um, a tremendous tremendous amount of work for AI um, industry as a whole. So um, why is this processing power important? Um, because AI and any model, deep learning model or any machine learning model has to um, analyze a lot of material, a lot of data before being able to actually uh, do anything. So you must first understand the data um, to be able to um, then do a specific job that um, they was designed to do. So to sift through all this material to learn from the data, it uh, needs a lot of computational power. And this is what uh, GPUs um, allowed, um, allowed 
these uh, deep learning models to uh, to be more efficient than than uh, they were ever before. So um, besides the uh, processing power, we also mentioned data. As I said, uh, as I said, data is food to uh, deep learning models. Uh, so it's really important. And in computer science and in mathematics in general, there is a, a famous phrase, garbage in, garbage out, which actually means that the quality of the input determines the quality of the output. It's same for deep learning models. So the quality of the data that you provide uh, to the neural network will uh, directly determine the quality of the output you can get. Of course, there's a lot of training in between. Um, there's a lot of um, um, weight correction and uh, optimizing the model and so on. Uh, but if you have bad data um, and you give it to a neural network, you, can, you can't expect anything than uh, a bad output. So the quality and the quantity of data is really important for neural networks. And it's a direct link of the level of uh, artificial intelligence applications that you can achieve um, um, when it comes to um, when it comes to data. So the more data, the better data you have, the the more advanced will the deep learning model or AI model uh, be. So in the bottom left corner, we have uh, an image. It's a, a captcha. Uh, image that's basically, uh, I'm sure you've seen it before, it uh, pops up quite a bit when you're surfing the web, um, and it asks you to confirm that you're not a robot. So um, if, you, uh, if you're if you at this point asking yourself, uh, after all the slides that we went through, is it really impossible for a robot or uh, a bot, for short, to be able to recognize uh, traffic lights in these images, uh, you would be correct to to ask that questions. It's really not that hard for AI to recognize traffic lights in this image. So why is uh, why are certain websites asking you to click on <clears throat> traffic lights? Well, there are, there are two answers to that question. First, when you um, confirm um, by clicking, I'm not a robot, and then you click on the images with the traffic lights, you're actually um, giving the website, um, um, you're giving it consent to uh, look into your activity so you can see your mouse movement and the last website you visited and so on. Uh, and this way, the website, of course, it's all anonymous and so on, but uh, this is the way a website can determine that you're not uh, an automated bot. So a bot would behave quite differently um, to human. And the second reason is directly linked to uh, the importance of data. So the, the title of the slide is um, the reason is when you are confirming uh, traffic lights in the image, you're actually training uh, a deep learning model um, from Google that is used to um, self-drive or drive a car. So all of us as Google users uh, are training the model. So we're giving it data uh, that it can learn from, that it can analyze all from this different perspectives, different images, different towns, different backgrounds, uh, different lights on the traffic lights and so on and so on. This is all fed to the neural network um, and the neural network then uses this data to learn basically to be able to drive as best as possible. Um, so that's the, the other reason. Data is, as I said, and I'll probably say uh, uh, a few times more, is uh, really uh, important. But when you see the, the, the rise of uh, data in uh, previous years and projections for uh, future years, um, it's really um, it's really scary, to say the least. So in 2010, we had uh, two zettabytes of uh, data. In 2020, we had 47. So this is uh, an increase of 20 or more 
uh, times. And the projection for uh, 2030 and 2035, we can see an exponential growth to uh, amount of data that's being created. Um, is this a problem? Yes and no. The amount of data uh, that we are capable of storing right now uh, or the technology that is uh, available for us to store the data is sufficient. Um, we recently got um, better disks. Um, certain companies uh, started building uh, data farms or server farms and so on and so on. Uh, but in the future, uh, we will need to optimize uh, data storage either by um, developing uh, new technologies or by optimizing uh, the technologies we have. Um, because at, if the projection is even uh, uh, um, even close to this uh, number, the amount of data that will be available in the next 10 years or so um, will be drastically, drastically um, larger than, than what it is today. Uh, I'm not sure what it is for this current year, 2023. Um, it's somewhere between 60 um, and 80, I think, uh, maybe more. I'm not really sure about the number, but there is a, the, the, tra the trajectory is, uh, is still rising. Uh, why is this important? Well, because I said, if uh, data is food for neural networks, imagine the difference between a model built in 2020 uh, with 47 zettabytes and one built in 2035 with 2142. So quite a, uh, quite a large difference right there. And not only that, there are other technologies that will uh, also impact the rise or uh, further development of um, AI. Um, I will mention uh, some of these technologies um, soon. So uh, just to briefly, uh, uh, just to briefly go over uh, how the net neural networks um, uh, train. So using the data, um, this is one of the most important processes in uh, building a neural network or a deep learning model. Um, so we have. Um, and I mentioned previously that we have uh, different types of um, uh, learning. So a way a neural network will uh, learn on the data that you provide it. So we have supervised learning, the one that I've um, actually explained. So we give it data, it will try to learn on this data, it will give, um, it will give some sort of uh, an output and then we would correct it uh, as we would with a human child. So no, that's wrong, don't do that. And we would uh, go back to uh, the beginning and the process would um, start again. And we do this as much time as needed for model to uh, provide good results. Uh, after it provides good results, then we can use it in, um, in a real world scenario or a research or something else. Um, a bit different to that is the unsupervised learning. You can um, see in the naming what uh, what the what the type of learning it actually is. Unsupervised learning is exactly that. So the neural network will learn completely on its own. Uh, we will not supervise it. We will not correct it. We will just uh, interfere if there's a technical issue with the neural network that we must correct. But in the um, ways of it actually. Uh, studying the data, we will not interfere. Um, there's a, an interesting uh, interesting example of this type of learning is um, uh, one of the ways that um, deep learning or neural network that beat uh, Gary Kasparov chess was, um, was taught is basically they copied the model. So they had two AIs and then they um, they gave it data, so they gave it um, um, historical matches. Uh, they gave it text. Uh, they they gave it rules in a textual format, and so on and so on. So they fed it a lot of data, and then they pitted um, these two networks to play uh, against each other. And this was really um, interesting uh, to observe. So um, two neural networks were, would play against each other. Um, 
and basically in the first couple of matches nothing happened not even the pawn was moved but after a while the neural network starts to adapt so that's one of the uh, advantages or one of the one of the things that made deep learning really powerful is the ability to adapt to new situations. So you have two neural networks playing chess. It would take millions and millions of matches until it could finally beat a uh, reigning world, uh, world champion. So there's another difference, even though I, in the previous example, I, um, I, used a human child uh, an example to describe the supervised learning the big difference between obviously a big difference between a human child and a neural network is that neural network um, can work 24 7 so it doesn't tire it doesn't have to stop to rest uh, to eat to sleep and so on so it can basically play a million million or even a billion uh, matches of chess in matter uh that is impossible to a human so not only is it much faster in moving the the pieces and getting to the end of the match it can do it over and over again and uh in the end we have the third type of learning which is uh, reinforcement uh, learning um and this is the link which i um suggest you go go and watch it's not that long but it's really really interesting uh it's the uh, research from OpenAI that was actually um that's behind chat gpt um and in this video they show uh their paper in which they used um, um intelligent agents to play hide and seek uh, in a 3d environment so four ais played hide and seek uh, hide and seek against each other it's really um it's an amazing video it's really interesting because you can see uh, some instances where ai uh, completely uh, broke the rules that it was given so it find a loophole in the rules and it took uh, no hesitation to exploit those rules so um, it's really interesting and a bit scary to watch but uh, really really shows the um, the power that um, these kinds of um, models and types of learning um, can have. Um, why am I mentioning all these types of learning? Because I want to emphasize um, the importance of uh, this process of training uh, the model. So without the training, uh, even though there's uh, uh, the training is misspelled here, uh, it is really important. Um, so in a supervised learning, uh, we would uh, use a certain amount of data, so a certain data set, and we would actually split it. Um, so we would take 60% of this data and we would only use this data for training. And then um, the, the um, division by percentage can vary a bit. So you can use 80% for training and 20% for testing. You can use 50-50. You can have uh, validation in between training and testing and so on. But not to over um, um, explain it. I don't want to... Um, don't want to go into too much detail the important thing is that whenever we build a neural network or a deep learning model or a machine learning model we need to give it data so last time but one more time i will uh, say so data is really important good data and enough data is really important once we have this and we build our model we will give it this data but we will not give 100%. We will always leave uh, 20% or uh, 15 or 25 or even 50% to test our model at the end of training. The rest of it, so in this case, we have 60% we will use to train uh, the model. So in our example of a chess match, two neural networks playing against each other, we can apply this uh, this logic so we would use 60 percent of all the historical chess matches that we have and we will give it um, we will give it to to the network the network will then study all these matches it will analyze the moves it will um, train it will train on this data and once once it's done with the training it will uh, then try um, to 
uh, or we'll give it the rest of the uh, testing data. So if we had 60% for training, we would use 40% uh, and we will give it to neural network uh, to test it, to see, did it learn anything? Will it give good results on chess matches that it hadn't seen before? And this way we can uh, see if the model is good or not. If it's good, then we can apply, we can uh, put it against a uh, reigning world uh, champion. Uh, if it's not good, then we go back to training. We uh, we reset uh, the training, we calibrate the weights, um, at least in the supervised learning, and then we go through the process again. And we repeat it until we have a model that uh, on this testing data, on these chess matches that are part of testing data, can actually provide good results. So this is really important. This is what allowed all these models um, to, um, to be efficient. It allowed all of these technologies that we uh, use today, and most of them do have uh, AI integrated into them. So um, I don't know, um, vacuum uh, cleaner robots uh, that are automated, smart fridges, self-driving cars, uh, Siri and Alexa that I've already mentioned. So all of these technologies are basically, um, basically, um, were built and trained um, in maybe not identical way, but pretty similar to this. So this is the basic logic. Of, of course, each model will have uh, a specific um, approach by its uh, developers. So uh, neural network for research and neural network that's driving a car um might not have the uh, uh same same approach by the researcher and the developer of the self-driving car ai but the basic uh point behind it all is um all of this that we've seen in the uh previous couple of slides um so in the end i'm just gonna uh, give a few more examples then i'm gonna check if there are any questions uh in the chat um, so besides the um, um, examples I've already mentioned, uh, some other that uh, I haven't mentioned are forecasting. So um, AI models or deep learning models are heavily used in uh, analyzing huge amounts of data to try to predict something. So Netflix, uh, also a company that's really popular or not as popular, but appears a lot in the media these days, uh, actually uses um, uh, these kind of algorithms to study the data it has on its user to try to predict what the user might like to watch in the future. And based on that, it gives uh, certain su suggestions. A lot of um, forecasts, um, weather forecasts um, is being done by uh, these models and so on and so on. Uh, Google Maps uses um, AI to um, forecast traffic. So when you see the red and orange um, lines on the road, uh, some of it is actually being predicted. Uh, so it can happen that you arrive at a certain stoplight and then there's no uh, car in sight. But Google, based on previous historical uh, data, predicted that uh, there might be a traffic jam at that uh, stoplight and so on and so on. There are, there are quite a few examples where you could use uh, deep learning models to predict or forecast um, something. Uh, computer vision, we've mentioned that before. Or, um, we've seen that in one of the previous uh, slides. Uh, it's um, computer vision is also really important for self-driving cars. So it gives the car or the AI, the software in the self-driving car to read the stop uh, signs or other sign traffic lights and so on. Um, analysis, so a lot of um, financial institutions and big businesses use uh, deep learning models to analyze um, data and, and not only financial institutions and businesses, but organizations and um, and uh, researchers and so on use uh, these models to um, perform certain analysis of data to come to a certain conclusion that they 
then they can act on. So either launch, launch a new product or make some changes to a certain product, um, um, launch a product on a new market or offer their customer um, discounts and so on and so on. So there's a, a lot of possible applications when it comes to data analysis. Uh, natural language processing, uh, we've mentioned that uh, quite extensively, uh, but we haven't mentioned uh, data mining and te text mining. I could make an entire presentation just uh, about data mining. This is uh, one of my uh, primary uh, fields of research as well. Um, and in deep mining, uh, I'm sorry, not in deep mining, in data mining, uh, deep models, uh, deep learning models and machine learning models are um, starting to become uh, the norm. So the the primary tools that you would use to um, get a hold of certain data, to clean it, uh, to prepare it for a certain analysis, and then to perform uh, the analysis. So all this is um, automated, and then um, a neural network or um, some other kind of machine learning model is built around it and then uh, used to, again, create uh, some new information. Uh, it's also used uh, on the web quite extensively. So when you're um, online scrolling through the web, uh, reading or shopping or anything else, there is um, in a lot of these places um, actually a deep learning model that's tracking um, your behavior, your habits, and so on. And then based on the data it collected about you or any of its users, um, then it tries to um, target ads um, or some something other um, to use as, um, as an individual. So this is a, a quite an often discussion that I have uh, with my students is, does Google um, listen to us, uh, illegally listens to us, or does it have um, uh, an advanced um, deep learning model that's actually um, really powerful and really precise when it comes to uh, predicting what we uh, would uh, want to purchase in the future? So that's a discussion for another day. Um, but um, it is definitely a fact that deep learning models are extensively uh, used in um, consumer tracking and rec recommendations and search and so on and so on. And uh, to conclude uh, this uh, presentation, what can we expect in the future? Um, so it is uh, projected that in the next 20 years or, or so, um, all the AI application will, of course, uh, improve uh, largely because all the other technology and processing power data that everything that we mentioned before will uh, most certainly improve as well. Um, um, we will have uh, better healthcare, safer, more effective uh, transportation, uh, education, um, and in other fields, you can name any field. Um, I'm sure that uh, you can find a um, application of AI uh, in it. But uh, what's most, um, what's actually one of the most interesting things about artificial intelligence is the technologies that are um, not directly linked to it, but um, can um, help AI and AI can help them to reach new levels that, um, so a certain synergy between, between these technologies. Um, those are 3D printing, internet of things and quantum computers, just to name a few. And I'm gonna explain um, in an example, uh, quantum computers. So quantum computers is something that's also similar to AI. Uh, we have uh, certain basic versions of it today, um, but a, um, wide um, application of it is expected in the next 10 to 20 years when we get general purpose quantum computers and we combine it with artificial intelligence then we will start to see um, big advances in both fields so this is the synergy i mentioned so 
both AI and quantum computers on their own are pretty powerful technologies. And of course, both can be used in various fields with, um, uh, with uh, high efficiency. But when you combine these two technologies, then you see uh, big, big advancements. We will have um, overnight, we will cure a lot of these um, problems uh, that we have today. And similarly, we can uh, we can um, um, compare 3D printing and AI and Internet of Things or sensors and so on and so on. Internet of Things and AI. Sorry, just a second. Sorry. Uh, so um, I wanted to say, so Internet of Things and Future AI is actually um, a combination of uh, technologies that brought uh, new concepts to life, such as smart cities and smart uh, businesses and so on, which uh, actually sees not, not only these two technologies, but quite a, a few more that um, work together to create um, these new concepts. For example, smart city is one that is um, mostly automated uh, and improved in such a fashion that um, the waste it produce the energy the city uh, wastes and so on and so on is drastically reduced some projections uh, even go to 70 or 80 percent um, i'm not certain if that's plausible at least not in a uh, in in the near future uh, but definitely the improvements um, can be um, seen even today. So um, the future of AI, of AI will be really interesting to watch. Um, um, nothing can be predicted for 100%. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, this is the technology that will, um, in the years to come, uh, be one of the uh, most important um, tools that we had in a while. Um, maybe since the the uh, appearance of internet if not even bigger than that uh, but it is uh, yet to be seen so uh, this is where i'll end my presentation um, and if there are any questions in the chat we'll try to answer them there are no ch no questions in the chat but if you do have any uh, questions or just want to discuss anything that was mentioned today i will just write my email address here so feel free to reach out and with this i'm gonna um, end the presentation and see you at another time bye